like Dr. Cohen said, this is um, the care of an inpatient with Crohn's disease. Um, this patient in particular is a 51-year-old white male who was diagnosed with ileal colitis in 2014. At that time, his initial um, presenting symptoms were, was right lower quadrant pain and diarrhea. In November, he had his initial colonoscopy that showed an edematous ileal cecal valve that couldn't be intubated, and pathology showed acute on chronic inflammation. A month later, he underwent a capsule endoscopy that also showed aphthous ulcers in the jejunum and ileum. Um, at that time, he was started on budesonide and oral mesalamine, and subsequently, um, he had a low normal TPMT and was started on low dose um, azathioprine at 50 milligrams a day. Um, based on his metabolite levels, he was gradually increased from 150 to 200 milligrams a day. He persisted to have the right lower quadrant pain and wasn't responding well to budesonide. His fecal calprotectin was 143. And in April of that, the following year, he underwent an MR enterography, which showed 12 centimeters of distal ileum with fibrostenotic Crohn's. Um, he did do a trial of a uh, medrol dose pack without any change in his symptoms. And ultimately, in July of that year, he underwent an ileal cachectomy, and the surgeon noted a little bit of a longer segment of um, diseased ileum with moderately severe fat wrapping. And other than that, his small bowel was without any evidence of active disease. Um, his postoperative course was uneventful, and he went home about three days after his surgery. And I actually saw him as an inpatient, discussed with his GI, and the plan was to restart his azoth azothioprine upon discharge at 200 milligrams a day. Uh, five days later, he presented to his outside hospital again with right lower quadrant pain, except this time he had fevers. They did a CT scan that showed a three by two centimeter mesenteric abscess by the anastomotic line. Um, the IB, he, at that time, he was transferred actually to our hospital, and we were actually consulted by our colorectal group about possibly inserting infliximab for possible recurrent Crohn's disease. And Dr. Rubin, or Dr. Cohen will <laughs> talk about what would be going on here. Right. So actually, the, this scenario, um, let me just go back for a second. This is not uncommon. I'll get calls saying, you know, we had this person, they just went to surgery, they had the resection, there was no disease, and now within weeks to maybe one to two months, they come back with an abscess and a fistula, and we want to give them infliximab. So the question is, well, what, what, is, what is it going on here? You see this, the CT um, finding there. So I guess the question is, uh, what could be going on to this patient? Uh, patient who have a cure of resection, no known Crohn's disease, now within weeks, let, even, even a couple of months, the question is, are they really going to have such bad Crohn's disease that they're already going to perforate through with a new fistula, um, that they're going to form an abscess? You, you'd be shocked at how many times um, I get called with this question or the patients are uh, given uh, infliximab. Um, like I said, how likely is this uncontrolled Crohn's disease? Uh, it would pre probably be pretty uh, notable, uh, maybe publishable, that someone came who had really had clean disease. You do wonder, though, or, or the other issue could be whether um, they had uh, missed something in surgery. Uh, sometimes it's very helpful to get the surgical operative report. We read through it and see, hopefully, there is some description. It's a little hard. A lot, some of these patients actually, you didn't know they had Crohn's. They presented with what they thought was appendicitis, and then they go to the, uh, go to the OR, and that's when they decide that they, you know, they really have Crohn's, and they may not have run the small bowel because they just did a, you know, a surgery at that point, and especially if they're laparoscopic, it's not as easy to, to run the bowel. And then the question is, well, what is, what is the immediate management? So now you have someone who's post-op and they have an abscess there. Um, what would you do with this person? Is this someone who uh, you would uh, treat for Crohn's disease with an agent like that? And then what do you do long term? So as I said, this is a, a scenario that we see quite often. And um, I saw some heads shaking when I asked if this was likely recurrent Crohn's disease. Anybody feel that this is? likely to be recurrent Crohn's disease a few weeks after surgery? What's that? Five days. I mean, this is the, that, that's right. This is within five days. But let's make it five weeks. In five weeks. I mean, it's, this is kind of quick, but it's, again, not uncommon uh, for us to hear this. The patient's kind of so-and-so doing okay at home. Maybe they had a you know, urinary tract infection, a woman, so they got antibiotics anyway, and, and suddenly now you're five weeks out presenting with an abscess or fistula even, uh, what, do you, what would you think a more likely 
possibility. So a leak of the anastomosis, correct. So then just backing up a little bit, um, we do have a designated transfer center for outside facilities to um, transfer patients from inpatient to an inpatient setting with us. Um, sometimes you may get the runaround from our operator, but we do have a direct line to the transfer center. Um, patients do try, but they cannot um, initiate their own transfer. <laughs> Um, outside hospital, Wait, mothers? Mothers? we have mothers, mothers? <laughs> aunts, uncles, <laughs> has to be physician to physician, or even case managers can actually initiate the transfer as long as they give us the callback number to the physician who's responsible or treating the patient. Um, so typically the outside hospital physician calls our transfer center directly to request transfer to either our service if it's more of a medical problem or uh, directly to our colorectal surgery service. Sometimes the sending hospital may not know which service is more appropriate, so we can always help facilitate that. Um, the transfer center team gets the basic clinical information and then pages either myself or the fellow on service. And then we call back the um, sending hospital just to get more of a general description of what's going on with the patient to determine which service would be more appropriate for the patient. Um, necessities to help expedite care for the patient um, that we prefer to come with the patient just to avoid any delays in care. Um, the most important to are probably the GI imaging um, on a disc sent with the patient, just because either way, if it's a medical or surgical problem or if the patient needs to be drained with our IR department, um, it helps delay any, um, it helps prevent any delays because we have the disc on hand and then we don't have to rescan the patient or wait for the disc to come in the mail. Um, glass pathology slides, we do have a designated pathology group that is very uh, well versed in Crohn's and colitis if we're ever guessing on the diagnosis itself. Um, all uh, clinic notes and inpatient records, obviously, um, essential reports, any procedure reports, operative reports are helpful as well. Um, and definitely any important labs, um, any metabolite levels, drug levels, um, which also helps prevent any uh, future cost to the patient if they already had these done within a couple years. Um, another thing um, to consider prior to transfer, if at all possible to avoid steroids in a patient that you know has an active abscess, um, unless of course they're steroid dependent or they need stress dosing of steroids. Um, so the patient most likely does have active inflammation in the setting of this um, active abscess, but typically the steroids can make the infection worse before it would help any more with the inflammation. Um, initiating broad spectrum antibiotics to avoid um, possible sepsis for a patient with an intra-abdominal abscess. Uh, we typically use um, IV cipro flagyl, but sometimes we may broaden a little bit more to cefepime uh, vancan flagyl. Um, can the patient be drained prior to transfer? Sometimes there may not be a safe window for um, interventional radiology to drain the patient. It might be more of a surgical course. Um, but regardless, if they can't be drained, the antibiotics are even more imperative at that point. Um, was the possibility of surgery discussed with the patient? Um, we never like to leave surgery as a last resort for the patient, so we always try to bring that up pretty quickly. Um, a lot of the times if patients have already progressed to penetrating disease with abscess formation, they're more likely going to um, need a surgical resection of that disease bowel, but we always like to bring that up right away. Um, and also for patient safety, um, and just so we can expedite care, um, transferring the patients right away early in the week. Um, sometimes our beds get a little hectic mid to the end of the week, so um, like most facilities, we have some weekend obstacles, um, pick line placement, IR procedures, and certain imaging is delayed as well, too. Right, right. but uh, generally, you know, we try and let us know to get the patients in. All of our rooms are, all of our beds are private beds in all the hospitals. Um, uh, we have a brand, the brand new hospital. Our patients are located. Almost always they'd be there. It's a surgical floor, so Jen's there, the surgeon's there, the OSPE nurse is there, everyone, everyone's together. So um, in this particular case, I'm um, showing you the, the scan again. The CAT scan was reviewed, and it was judged by IR that they really weren't going to be amenable to draining this. As Jen mentioned, if you're at your center and there is a drainable abscess, just have them drain it then and there um, and put it, keep the drain in. It's much faster than for us to get someone on a Friday at 5 p.m. where suddenly we have to call IR and say we need this, this emergent drainage that we know has been gone, going on for 72 hours. Obviously, broad spectrum antibiotics. So this patient did well on the IV antibiotics and um, was discharged an oral antibiotics. So, the, I mean, the surgeons you know, saw the patient, they said, well, you know, this may have been an anastomotic leak or et cetera, but 
Um, they just had surgery very recently. They prefer not to go into the belly if they don't have to since the patient was responding. We'll see if we can treat through with IV antibiotics and then oral antibiotics and see what happens. So a couple of, two and a half weeks later, when the patient stops the oral antibiotics, um, they get to get fevers and, and pain. And they went back outside hospital again, has an, an abscess, atheanastomosis, puts back on oral antibiotics and did well. And a uh, CAT scan, as you can see here, and the anastomosis, that white is this, this surgical anastomosis, shows that they have dilated small bowel loops leading up to the inflamed anastomosis. So again, the question is thrown to us, well, does this someone have a Crohn's disease stricture? I mean, they had anastomosis. We know that patients who had even surgical anastomoses from diverticular um, you know, surgeries can, can, can represent with a stricture. So now we're sitting here, and, and uh, they don't see an abscess now. Um, they had one, but they were off antibiotics or back on antibiotics. Should we treat them through with antibiotics? And then should we start them on infliximab? Everyone's always, everyone's always wanting us to start on infliximab to see if we can treat this stricture. How many of you think that would, would be a reasonable thing to do, to get them through the infection part and then treat their stricturing Crohn's with infliximab? No one's raising their hand. Well, uh, eventually, they had redo other anastomosis surgically, and it turns out that there was no Crohn's disease, disease seen, just as was uh, predicted in the crowd, that this was just a surgical uh, complication, a leak at the anastomosis, stricture formation, and um, the, subsequently, the patient um, did well since that time. So the take home messages you probably all guess is that patients who have, first of all, patients, this patient had stricture and disease before their surgery, and usually if you have a stricture and disease and you don't respond to, to steroids, um, you, you often will need a resection. That's almost like a stress test. People have obstructive Crohn's, steroids aren't getting better. Typically, the likelihood of them avoiding surgery from that point is pretty low, uh, even if you buy time with something else. Um, Post-operative abs uh, abscesses are related to surgery, not to Crohn's disease, and usually require surgery if conservative management fails. It doesn't always fail. And then, as Jen pointed out, we'd love to get transferred patients, um, try to get the uh, important information, particularly the scans. It's really a shame when you get a young person, we have to redo a CAT scan because they didn't send it with them. Um, and uh, we actually like to get the path slides because our, our, our surgeons like to know, does this patient really have Crohn's or colitis? We've actually had a number of years ago someone who just had a bad C. diff colitis, never had ulcerative colitis sent to us who went to uh, surgery. Now, they probably need the surgery anyway because they had really bad C. diff colitis, but um, they never even actually had IBD. So we like to have proof that they have the IBD. And then, of course, and I, and I made this slide, <laughs> the APN gen can play a critical role in ensuring a smooth transition flow to the hospital course, and actually post-operative discharge uh, resumption of medicine. So uh, our surgeons will see the patient um, two weeks afterwards. Michelle Rubin, who's in the back, the surgical APN is often the person doing that appointment. And very often, Jen will, will also come by, because somehow, the, in, the, in the big shuffle of papers from the discharge, the patient never started the medicine that we wanted or you wanted to restart them on. She also reassesses them and, and, and talks with Michelle and decides, well, can we restart the TNF now? Or is there a question of a little wound infection? Maybe we'll wait a, a couple more weeks. Um, and the continuity is extremely, extremely helpful. 